I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each episode we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we are talking about The Truman Show, the 1998 film written by Andrew Nichol and directed by Peter Weir. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayeros. Hi. Okay, so uh, before we get into this episode, want to announce that our next episode is going to be on Avatar, uh, <laughs> the, the, the blue one, the James yep. Cameron one, uh, yeah. in preparation for uh, The Way of Water. In celebration, I'll share that quote we all remember from the movie, which is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> look at that Avatar. <laughs> Thought it was there, uh, but then the, the quote had some unobtainium or something. Yeah. <laughs> In, insert unobtainium joke here. Uh, anyway, so if you want to prepare for that, watch Avatar. We're going to. And then we're going to talk about it. But for now, we are talking about The Truman Show, which I am very excited about. This movie is one that's on my that list that I have in my head of movies that I wanted to make a lesson from the screenplay video about every month, but it just never quite happened. Uh, so I'm very excited that we get to talk about it now. I love this movie. I think I can safely say it's one of my favorite movies now, which I wasn't sure about or like hadn't really grasped until watching it this time and watching it for maybe the 10th time as it's getting to the finale in the third act, I'm getting emotional still and like fighting back tears. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. I think I love this movie. And I remember loving it as a kid and being fascinated by the premise of the Truman Show and having like childhood, not panic attacks, but freakouts because I was pretty sure I was in the Truman Show. Right. I'm sure that's something many people have experienced that we all mm -hmm. went through. But as I revisited this movie over the years, as I grew older, as my appreciation for film increased, I just kept loving it. And there's just really smart, clever writing. The structure is really interesting. There's some really great performances. The music is powerful. And the story is just this, like, on the surface about, like, humans and entertainment and just, like, the way the world was in 98, which has maybe just gotten even more crazy in terms of, uh, you know, television and watching and entertainment, all the things. So there's that on the surface. And then below it is this very deep human archetypal, almost like man versus God story of who am I and what is our place and what is we're living for and what is we're dying for. So all of that's happening while it's also just being super entertaining and fun. So great movie is my review. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to hear from you guys. Brian, why don't you tell me about the German show? Uh, yeah, I was a, a big um, Jim Carrey fan uh, in the 90s, especially during that crazy run of movies. You know, then I then I moved to L.A. and realized like, oh, Burbank and Ventura are, are places like a lot, <laughs> a lot of characters in movies. They just kind of like looked out their window and was like, I don't know, Tommy Tarzana. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I always loved this movie. I had not seen it in quite a while, um, but I definitely saw it several times at the time. Um, and uh, but this is my first time really watching it as like a film appreciator, you know, whatever you want to call it, like as a screenwriter, as like like really appreciating what it's doing, what it's doing with perspective, what it's doing with structure, you know, like so much of that stuff that I did not appreciate before. Um, and and yeah, you know, like you guys mentioned the the sort of reality t TV thing. And it's like, yeah, it's ubiquitous now. But at the time, it's almost like once a thing becomes a big thing, then that's when like it starts popping up into movies like AI or, you know, whatever, like that kind of stuff. And then eventually it's like, oh, now this is everywhere. But like there's those early even like Terminator, right? Like there's those early movies that are like, oh, this new technology just showed up. It's scary. It's weird. Let's talk about it. Right. And I just think reality tell it's I've always been so fascinated by it because it's like, let's point a bunch of cameras at you and have you pretend that you're just living a real life, even though, you know, there's a bunch of cameras pointed at you. And then let's edit all that footage into whatever story we want to tell anyway. Um, but there's this fascinating kind of flip side to it with the Truman Show, which is that the character doesn't know he's being filmed. So then it's like it is sort of as close as you can get to 
let's actually examine a real life 24 hours a day, even though, you know, the world is fabricated and the performance, all that kind of stuff. Right. But in terms of just watching that one character um, and then it kind of turns into a time loop movie, like when, you know, when he's <laughs> like, I know what's going to happen. I'm like, oh, is this Groundhog Day all of a sudden? Um, so, yeah, really excited to get into a lot of that stuff. But in general, it's a movie that I've always loved, but I had not watched it in a while. And I really like reappreciated this time around. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Alex, what are you? Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing this when it came out or I don't know if I saw it in theaters or just at home, but really loving it. And it was you know, right before The Matrix and other films that were exploring, like, what if reality isn't real? And those themes always really hit hit me. And I love sci fi. And this is kind of a sci fi movie in some ways. Um, I mean, definitely the the technology <laughs> of, of this dome is kind of sci fi. <laughs> and and I I just really. Yeah, I appreciated it on that just pure plot and cool idea level as a young person and as you said michael as i've grown older it just it just hits me in deeper and deeper ways and i just see so many political and philosophical allegories and the way that it kind of not only envisions a world of reality tv but a world of like social media of instagram of just life being lived in public and that it's real. It's, it's my real self being publicly broadcast. It's not fake. So much of what they're saying in that, in those opening interviews felt weirdly like, yeah. ah. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I just found it to be just, it just keeps getting better and keeps getting more like prescient. Uh, so yeah, continue to love it. And I agree, Michael, I think it might be on my top something you know it's, it's up there <laughs> yeah. as far as movies that i just really when i watched them like there's nothing in this that i would really change like it's just perfect yeah thanks trisha what about you yeah i adore this movie um i've seen it i don't know probably more than 10 times to be honest like i've seen it so much um because it's one of those movies that i find to be like comforting and and also fun and but also thought provoking and just very, very well made and put together. I appreciate that about it every single time, like noticing new details about the way that it all kind of like fits together as a puzzle, but also as a plot. And um, it's just great. Like it's one of these movies that it stands out miles ahead of the pack. Um, and I think, too, like, you know, you guys have touched on some of the most interesting aspects of it to me. Uh, the genre is one, as you just mentioned, Alex, it's like, what is this? Like, if you were going to pitch this movie now, what is it? It's not a thriller, right? There was a thriller version of this. Andrew Nichol wrote it as like a thriller and it was supposed to be directed by Brian De Palma uh, and wow. set in New York City. <laughs> and um, it, we didn't get that movie. So it's not a thriller. It's not political necessarily. It's not violent. It's not an action movie by any stretch. It's not a rom-com. It's not even really a straight-ahead comedy. Um, it's a dramedy, I guess, but it mm -hmm. doesn't have, like, the determined quirk or, like, sort of off-puttingness of, of indie movies of the time. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, I don't know. It's just, like, it is so unto itself, like the Truman Show. And, you know, it's a it's rated PG. <laughs> like mm. it's about <laughs> really mature themes. It's not a kid's movie, but you could take a, uh, middle schooler or even like, you know, somebody, I, you wouldn't take somebody younger just cause they'd be bored by it, but it's not as though it's being like determinedly like gritty or edgy or anything like that. It is just a movie about something that's kind of mature in its ideas um, and it's sophisticated in its construction. Uh, so it's for adults, but it's a PG movie and it's very accessible. So I love all of those things about it. I also think it's so fascinating and I want to get into the aesthetics of the world that it imagines, right? Like you have something like The Village, which we recently talked about <laughs> on a, a patron exclusive episode. And we talked about that movie uh, or the construction of the fake world that the people in that movie make for themselves as being reactionary, right? There's a very clear, we've created this in opposition to something that's out there that we don't like. And nothing about the Truman Show is interested really in like 
how Truman's world is different, like from the real world, quote unquote. Um, we have characters that live in the world outside of Truman's world, but it's not like it's especially violent or it's especially crass or it's, you know, there's a lot of talk of like, you're safe in this world and it's dangerous out here, but we, we don't see any danger out there. It's just a very familiar, pretty safe, pretty benign world. And I do want to talk more about that. And then the actual aesthetics of the world itself being this like 1950s, you know, white picket Pleasantville. fence. Pleasantville. Pleasantville, yeah. American dream yeah. kind of, yeah, like mid-century sitcom essentially looking place, I think is so interesting. So like, I can't wait. I, I'm so glad we finally get to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, just one thing you touched on, it's something I thought about was this movie holds back in so many places. Oh, like yeah. it could have been, it could have been a big sci-fi thing. It could have been a big thriller thing. It could have been the midpoint he gets out. And then the second half of the movie is him right. like navigating the world. Right. Um, it could have been, you know, or he, or he gets backstage and he is actually like confronting, you know, breaking into the thing and confronting Christoph or whatever. Um, it could have been a Jim Carrey comedy in the way that this movie like is very much not you know um and uh and, and even just like just in general the scope of it it feels very small like it feels like yeah. by the end of the movie i haven't watched much happen even though like literally everything has happened like the entire story world is is broken right and the protagonist is freed but it just and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean i just it just feels very small and intimate um so yeah i was appreciating this time around just a lot of how much this movie could have done a bunch of obvious things and chose not to well, and like, and the runtime is like a little shorter, right? Like it's just yeah. under two hours, which I appreciate. So it is kind of that, like you're saying, Brian, there's something that feels like bite sized snacky about it or just like, like something you can eat. It's like Lambda bread. You can, you just need to have a little <laughs> bit of bite from Lord of the Rings, but you'll Lord be full of the Rings for reference forever. out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Although I like that it's Lambda now. It's, it's a, a Latin letter. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. Gonna a say. Greek letter. Lambda All right. I, now we're. I know what it's called. <sighs> I know, but then I, how do you say everything is wrong? <laughs> Delta. This episode of Beyond the Screenplay is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. Mubi is for lovers of great cinema and those who don't know they love great cinema yet. Each film is thoughtfully handpicked by Mubi's curators. With Mubi, myself and the whole Beyond the Screenplay team have been exposed to movies we never would have encountered, and we've discovered new favorites as well as been able to watch old favorites not streaming anywhere else. Mubi is the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. And you can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash beyond the screenplay. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash beyond the screenplay for a whole month of great cinema for free. Thanks to Mubi for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. Well, so one of the things I, that I was paying attention to on this watch was the reveal of information. And kind of because I've seen this movie so many times, I had forgotten that if you just go into this movie not knowing anything, that you don't know anything and you don't know yeah. everything that's going to happen and like what the Truman Show is and how the mechanics of all that work. And so it was really interesting to kind of pay attention to the mystery that they set up about what is going on exactly, where they have this opening montage, where they're interviewing the different cast members we find out and are sort of telling us that there's this thing called the Truman Show. Um, but it's just kind of setting the stage and giving you teases and you don't really get a full confirmation that, of the scope of what this thing is until the midpoint. And I think it's really interesting in the first half of the film how they dole it out, starting with that um, opening montage. But then Truman steps outside on the first day we see him and a light falls from the sky and mm -hmm. he picks up the light and it's like a stage studio light and it's labeled with you know, the name of a star. Like that's such a great little puzzle piece to insert in there for the audience. And, you know, he's 
calling, trying to find someone in Fiji. Why is he like, who's he trying to find in Fiji? It's a sign to go sell insurance, I guess, to someone off the island and he can't get on the boat because he, when he passes on the pier, there's an underwater sunken boat and the music gets all dark and it's like, oh, there's something with boats and water. So the, the especially the first half of the first act does a lot of cool uh, setting up little mysteries, raising questions in the audience's mind that eventually all get paid off. And it does it in a really just efficient and entertaining way, which I was really appreciating. Well, and I would love to make a chart of like the different, I guess, plot lines, but like story threads and where we kind of get the quote unquote mystery or dramatic question of them answered. Um, Because you mentioned you mentioned that uh, the scope of the, you know, illusion, I guess, is revealed at the midpoint, but it's not. It's actually later than that. It's three quarters of the way through the movie, that montage where um, where it's like Truman is asleep. It's it's kind of after the crisis, actually, where Truman is uh, or he's in the corner of his screen drinking coffee or <laughs> Mococo picture picture. drink. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Picture in picture. And then like we hear that, that we see the true talk show. Right. And it kind of goes through the history of the show. I always think that's the midpoint, but it's not, it's so much later than that. After. Yeah. And I, it's all such critical information to like understanding right. the rest of the movie that I, I always like retroactively revisit it when I'm watching the movie again and think about it. It's like, oh, yeah, now I'm going to see uh, the like guy who in, infiltrated their family Christmas when Truman was like five years old. And now I'm going to see that. And like you don't see that for a really long time. And I think that's a great example of the restraint that you mentioned earlier, Brian. But also... Like I said, I think a chart of where information is revealed would be interesting because it does that perfect thing where we actually do get the story of what happened to Truman's father relatively early. We get the flashback on the boat. We see his dad drown at sea. We don't know what kind of a flashback it is. It has this sort of like televised look and everything. Um, But we don't see that it's like, fake, you know, I think later, it's much later that we see his dad with a diver Mm, that mm -hmm. reveals that it's like he wasn't dead at that point. That's when Christoph, I think, talks about that. But those are paid off fairly quickly only as new things are being introduced. And so I think it's really masterfully done where it's like nothing keeps your attention or demands that you sustain the mystery in your own mind for so long that you're then like not paying attention to what's happening in the rest of the story or like wondering about the logistics of everything. And I, I think to, I think the psychological aspect of why Truman is stuck on the Island goes miles toward that. So setting that up as one of the first things where it's like, maybe, you know, the rest of the um, obstacles that keep him there, I think we would be like, well, just go around it. We'll just do this. We'll just do that. Um, we would logically like dismantle them so quickly were it not for the fairy scene. We understand Truman is afraid of water. We saw his dad drown at sea and that piece being revealed so early on is like just covers a multitude of like other questions that we have about why he's there and and what his life is like. Well, and like the, the reveal of the actual physicality of the dome and like its location, like in yeah. Burbank or whatever, that doesn't come until later, right? That's, that's yep, pretty later. That's in the movie. way later. Yeah. That's in the montage. Yeah. I always assume it's in the opening credits, but it's not at all. It's like mm. way later. And I think that's a really smart choice for all these reasons where, you know, if we knew from the start that he was just in a big dome, mm. the mystery would be so much less interesting. Like there's so many ways you can think about the environment he's in and that he's on an island and, I think it's just so much it's so much more fun as an audience member to see the layers get pulled back as time goes on versus up front. You could have easily put that in the opening montage. Oh, definitely. Um, and it still would have been a good movie, but I think there's probably just a lot of fun. You're denying your audience and just their own wondering and questioning and trying to put it together. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's a great example of a thing that, I'm not even thinking about because I've seen the movie so many times, but right. if you're watching it for the first time, like, like yeah, he might just be on an reasons. island, right? You know, and yeah. maybe those, like maybe the sky looks kind of fake cause it's just bad special effects in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting cause there's this sort of, 
like there is this like BF Skinner kind of thing going on, right? Which is just like, we'll just give him a fear of water. We'll just give him a fear of flying, right? And it's like, it's appropriate because uh, Harry Shearer, the voice of Principal Skinner, is uh, the interviewer in this movie. <laughs> uh, knowledge bomb. <laughs> but it's interesting because the fear of water, like that works really well, right? Like we see how effective that is. But the fear of flying, they're trying really hard, right? They're like, oh, look at this like demotivational poster. <laughs> it's like, this could happen to you, right? In the travel um, agency. I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so brilliant. Um, but then it's it's cool to see that like that doesn't really work for him, right? I right. mean, especially because obviously he wants to go to Fiji specifically, but also it's just, I think it's a nice little nature versus nurture thing where it's like, yeah, we, we couldn't completely program him the way that we thought we could, which is, you know, a good, <laughs> says nice things about humanity, I guess you could say. <laughs> Yeah. But it's immensely complicated. Like Mm -hmm. just going back to this chart that I want someone to make the Fiji part and the Lauren, like, why does he think that, why is he looking for somebody named Lauren or Sylvia? Right. Right. Why Mm -hmm. is he looking in Fiji? And then he tells Marlon he wants to go to Fiji. And then like we see he has a map of Fiji in his basement. And it's like, why that is important to him isn't revealed until much later. The same thing with like the magazines. What's he doing with like the magazine cutouts Mm. that comes later too. And it's just so complex the way all of the different pieces of it fit together. I was thinking this time around about, um, Meryl's advertising. (laughs) Like the moment we meet her, she's like, look what I got at the checkout, hun. Right. Um, and like tells him about the chef's mate tool or whatever. And it's the fact that everything is sponsored on the show is not explicitly stated until that montage at the very like three quarters of the way through. Like I mentioned, like what are the revenues of the show coming from? Well, sponsors, but these things are teased like so early on and there's so many of them. And when the script chooses to pay them off is masterful. And I don't even know how I would like how, how I would even begin to sit down and plot it out if I were going to write this myself. Well, I think it's a great example of good mystery box writing. Oh, I think yeah. There was recently maybe a video essay or somebody posted on our Discord about like uh, the Rings of Power being maybe not the best example of mix- mystery box uh, story construction. Um, mm-hmm. But I think like this movie, The Matrix, the original Matrix, like they're just such such brilliant mystery box movies because they do what you're saying trisha they give you all these interesting like something's off something's weird something's not right about this but i can kind of like justify it in my mind or it can kind of just fit with the weirdness of the story world for now but then when the payoff comes later and it comes at just the right time where i haven't forgotten about it it's still present in my mind it's really satisfying it all makes sense it all clicks into place and i don't feel like it was an out of nowhere reveal or twist or surprise right. it, it was always there and i just kind of like dealt with it until i knew what it meant um and so i, I just think a lot of people try to do the mystery box thing a lot of like i think recent sci-fi tv shows have tried to do the mystery box thing and i think there's a way in which it can be dragged out for so long or be so kind of random that we don't get these feels that we get with the Truman Show or the Matrix. And I think it's it's worth revisiting these movies because I think a lot of us are trying to recreate these feels. And I think you can't just do it willy-nilly. There's there's an art to the way it's constructed here. Yeah. It's also a big difference between a TV show where it's like, we set something up in episode two that paid off in episode nine, right? And then it's like, wait, I was I was supposed to remember that thing. And then like yeah. the previously on like shows you the thing. So then <laughs> right, you're going right, like, right. oh, I guess that's going to pay off. Then like, I guess that guy's coming back or whatever, right? Yeah. But like, that's what's nice about a feature film, right? Is like, you've got under two hours to right. be like, my brain still remembers the thing that you told me an hour ago. On a totally unrelated Side thought. I remember when Ed Harris showed up in Westworld. I was like, he just cannot stop himself from controlling like <laughs> universes where people are. <laughs> totally so unrelated at show to this yeah. topic. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the point that you're making there, Alex, about like how contained some of these arcs that you're bringing up, Trisha, are um, is really important because, you know, the so we get the Fiji T's. But then we get a flashback where we see him escape with what's her name? Lauren. Lauren? Sil- Sil- Slash Sylvia. Sylvia. Right. It, her, the name of her character, like the extra that she's playing on the show is Lauren. It's Lauren. Right. But then okay. she tells real him her name. real name is Sylvia. Is yeah. Sylvia. Yes. S for Sylvia. 
we see that flashback. All of that wraps up, according to my notes, around 27 minutes. So that's kind of like the end of the first act. And it's kind of interesting because that's that's kind of when we learn that he's already had some red flags waved yeah, about like, right. your world is not real, like something weird is going on. And so it's this kind of interesting uh, multi-layered series of inciting incidents where him seeing his dad obviously like triggers stuff but then that's actually compounding something that's already happened in you know somewhat recent history and i just think the way that is revealed is really interesting and is an example of here's a mystery here's a question we're gonna let you think about it for a while now you have the answer and it's going to complicate the rest of everything and while we're doing that we're seeding new mysteries um yeah, this movie has tons of those. Also, its placement where it is in the movie, it's it's we we're given his objective. We're, we're we don't have to mm -hmm. wonder for too long why he wants to go to Fiji. What's what's this all about? We we get a really clear reason for his needing to get out off this island, and we feel it. We we see the chemistry. We see their moment together. Um, and I think it's really important because. Like, once again, a, maybe a bad mystery box version would be we don't get to find out what Fiji means until act yeah. three. And then we, I, I'm not invested in him going to Fiji right. if that's part of the mystery. Yeah, I mean, talking about things that could have been that, that sort of feel like they're pulled back, like e even just even just that, like I, in my memory, it's, you know, Truman is like a happy go lucky guy for the first half hour of this movie. And we're also constantly cutting to Kristoff and that kind of stuff. Right. And then something happened, like a big inciting incident happens, right? And then he's like, well, now I know the world and I gotta get out of here. But no, it's like right from the get-go, he is suspicious and whether or not he's suspicious of the world, he is just restless, right? So he feels like he wants to go and he wants to do other things. And I like that better for the theme than just sort of, I think it's a, it feels a little more obvious, but I think the movie could work perfectly fine if, he was just totally in love with his life until something happened that sort of like triggered, you know, his his desire to kind of figure this out. But but for the theme, I just like it better that he that he's not actually happy here. He is restless. He wants to get out. Yeah. And I think that's that's what makes this movie powerful on so many emotional levels that it's not just a sci fi about escaping, you know, a mm -hmm. reality. It's about escaping, you know, your aspects of your life that are holding you back or feeling fake or making you not feel like a real person. And, and, and I think the, the Sylvia thing that we're talking about is one of the first times in the movie that I think is really powerful that it's, they're starting to comment on, like, you can't control certain aspects of right. being a human. Like we're going to give you Laura Lenny. She's pretty, she's blonde. She's going to fall into your lap, all these things. It's perfect. Ideal, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but instead he falls for this other person because you can't control love. And I love that this movie uh, like has like those inserts positive human uh, aspirational aspects throughout in these like specific and powerful ways. Well, and to your point, Brian, that like it isn't just one thing. It isn't just the incident with Sylvia that makes him suspect everything's fake or and it isn't just his dad and it isn't just the star that falls onto the middle of the street. There's actually quite a few things that happen in the first act that reveal the artifice of his world. And one of the biggest, so there's the scene on the beach where he's just sitting on the beach looking at the ocean and then the rain starts, right? And it like <laughs> falls only on him. So the star falls almost onto his car. Then the rain is falling only on him and he understands that it's falling only on him, right? Like it quickly resolves itself, but he knows there's a beat where he's like, this is weird. It's only raining on me. But then the biggest one is the radio broadcast. That's a huge piece of the puzzle that starts to make him question his reality because he hears them talking about where he's driving and then he decides not to go to work that day because he becomes really convinced that something is wrong, right? Like he goes and sits in the square instead and looks around at everybody and tries to notice if the extras are paying any attention to him kind of a thing. And so I think, you know, Kristoff and the show's creators 
uh, are never questioned about those kinds of mistakes, right? Because they're, it's not just technical difficulties. Also, like, how did Kirk get back in there? <laughs> like, they talked about, you know, he, like, snuck back on set, I guess. But how, right? Technically, that's the fault of the show's creators, as is the falling light, as is the radio broadcast, as is the rain. There are all kinds of mistakes that are revealing. It's not just the fact that, like, Laura Linney can't stop talking about product placement. It's <laughs> – there are real technical serious like security and and uh, other kinds of errors that are happening um and the movie doesn't want us to think too hard about that aspect and it almost it's almost working on this meta level where it's like uh Christoph doesn't want the audience to think too hard about that they, he wants to you know focus on what Truman is doing it's all about Truman like seeing his dad and not accepting his father's death and not and his fear of water and all of this stuff the problem is with Truman right instead of like the problem is that the cracks are showing all the time in this world that we've created and so I think that it's really interesting those different aspects these different little pushes that happen to Truman in the first act beyond just like he is unhappy in his marriage the show the Truman show within the movie is more concerned about that. Truman's unhappy. Laura Linney wants to keep him here by telling him they should have a baby. Um, he wants to go to Fiji because he's in love with someone else. The show is focused on that. And I agree that's compelling, but also the show doesn't want you to notice how bad it is at being a show. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I also like how many of those things we can kind of infer. We can two plus two mm -hmm. as the audience, right? Like the ad reads, right? Where it's just like, oh, okay, I get it. I don't need to know who the sponsor is. I don't need to know. I don't need to hear like a voice in her ear. I mean, how, how often are there probably voices in their ears that we actually don't hear, but we just, we just get it, right? We're like, oh, suddenly they're going like, oh, they like totally changed course, right? Like, oh, okay, Christoph told them to, or some operator told them to. Um, and, uh, and same with things like, Kirk getting back on, or even at the end when Sylvia is like putting on her coat, I'm like, where's she going? I'm like, all oh, right, she knows where the like. There's just it's it's over there. She knows like where the ex. <laughs> she knows exactly where that is, right? But we don't. We haven't seen it. But that's fine. We can infer from the world that we've been given that like that's all there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of this is getting at a, a question suggestion from a patron, Bird Dog Smith. Uh, who wanted us to do an in-universe critique of Kristoff's storytelling and cinematography. <laughs> uh, and I think it's these things that we're pointing out, I think are why in my head, I categorize this as a movie and not a film, you know, that highly technical uh, mm. categorization mm -hmm. that I do. Um, but th this movie does, doesn't seem interested as we're pointing out in extreme verisimilitude, but it yeah. is, it, like it's more of like this is a fable like sit down and i'm gonna mm -hmm. tell you a story about a man who was trapped in a dome like that kind of vibe which i really like and i think it does it so well that it lets me excuse the things that would not make sense even the pet pv things that i have where it's like there are cameras like they're cutting to, to perspectives where there could not physically be a camera at times like He's in the water and like the camera's right <laughs> down underneath. Like, really? Like that's there's a cameraman in the water next to the person or like, oh, there's a crane shot happening. Sure. Yes, yeah, there's definitely a crane shot in the middle of this, like, you know, plaza where he would be able to see a crane with a camera. On. Anyway, so there's things like that that like really bother me throughout the movie. But because this movie is signaling so much like this is not supposed to be reality um, in lots of ways. I'm not bumped by it. And I think it enhances, lets you just focus on the emotion of the storytelling, which I really like. I am fascinated because because I know you uh, talked about Star Wars as a fable too, like A New Hope specifically, as just like a movie where you don't need the like, the interstitials, you don't need the long conversations about how this thing happened or how the world works, right? And I think The Matrix, The Truman Show and Star Wars are all great examples of of that, where it's just like, you, you don't we're not trying to sell you this like super realistic world we're just trying to tell you a simple story about a character but then what have star wars things and matrix sequels done 
is we then we then get the scene where people are disobeying direct orders and and you know like here's how this here's who actually built the ship here's who actually does this thing and it and it's and it just like breaks the fable a little and the nice thing about the Truman Show is as of yet we only have the Truman Show right so we don't Say have it the quietly oh God, God please, please. <laughs> this is the most self contained movie ever please, please let it stay that way but guys what happened when he gets out I want to yeah. know I don't want to know Kristoff <laughs> had another show ready Absolutely. to go. Back a up. bigger dome. That dome was inside <laughs> this other. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with that, Brian. The the, the fable ness of this movie is part of what makes it feel so special. And I I think like the film form, the ninety minute like to two hour film form, is so good at allegory and fable. And it's just it because that that's you want a tidy, self contained, enclosed system for that kind of story. And the length and the scope of a movie is so perfect for that. Um, and yeah, just it, I want more movies like this. I didn't time it, but this movie has got to have one of the fastest exits of all time. Like mm. Truman bows. He says his catchphrase and mm. it's got to be less than a minute. Like Kristoff takes off his glasses. Truman goes out the door. Sylvia puts on her coat and goes downstairs. Everybody watching on their various screens cheers and is excited. And then what else is on TV? Cut to black. Like, it's just, yeah. it's so fast and it's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant ending to a movie because then you're sitting in the movie theater or in your house or whatever, cheering with everybody who's so happy Truman got out. So happy Truman got out. Cut to black. This is it. This is it. That's all you need. It's done. It's, a, it's such a quick exit. And again, going back to that parable, like, the climactic choice is the only resolution. That is the only question we need answered. I was struck this time by the fact that Marlin vanishes. Like, That's a really good point. We yeah. spend a ton of time with him. Um, and I suspect we had a patron that asked us about the deleted scenes, and I apologize. I haven't seen them. I suspect, there, though, there must have been one, right? There must have been a scene. Um, in fact, I think I remember reading that there was a scene where, like, at one point during the escape, he sees Truman and doesn't say anything or, like, chooses not to mm. say anything. But he, we spend so much time with that character, and he just exits the movie kind of off screen. We have that scene where he's talking directly into camera to Paul Giamatti and he's like, well, I've finished searching this place and that place and he's not there. And he's like, well, go and look over there. And everyone's back at their one positions, right? And you get that amazing shot of everybody standing at their one positions. That is literally the last time we see Marlon. He's just gone. We forget about him. He's gone. We forget about the minute she leaves the movie, Laura Linney, Meryl, gone. Like, the movie is not concerned with like giving an exit to the supporting characters or some kind of resolution, acting like they have an arc or anything like that. It's so focused on Truman that the ending is just like bing, bang, boom. Goodbye, Truman. Kristoff is disappointed. <laughs> End of movie. <laughs> I love it. We also have to appreciate that these actors either chose or were given the names of Marlon and Merrill. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's also part of that POV shift, right? Because it's like yep. at, at the beginning of the third act. Now we're on Kristoff's world. We don't really need to know what's going on with Marlon and Merrill. They're the center of Truman's life while we're with Truman. But once we're with uh, Christoph and the operators. Now it's just about what's going on with Truman himself. So now Truman's sort of supporting cast of characters takes a backseat to the the story world itself. It also feels of a part of the fable quality once again. You know, all these people are not even. I, I think they're they're representative in a way. Like like this this entire world of people that was the illusion that was the facade. They're, they're all kind of of a piece. And in, in this fable, he is leaving that world behind. It's almost like they're not full people, really, because we don't ever get to know them outside of their role as actors in his little show. Um, there might be some subtext or some hints at what they actually feel about things. But um, I think there that helps to reinforce the allegorical fable like quality that once he leaves the island, it's gone. It's behind it doesn't really matter what happened to them because this is a story about a man escaping from this world he's been trapped in. 
yeah. uh, all the meanings that come with that. And I like that there's enough, oh God, there's so many things to talk about. Oh. I like that there's an, enough subtext with the, the actors in, within mm -hmm. the Truman Show that you can kind of reverse engineer what their deal is. Like the mom, I feel like you get a little bit of a sense of like, she she considers herself like a consummate professional and like, yeah. you know, she even has a couple lines, but you can tell she's like really into it. And like, I'm the best mother. I'm nailing this. Like I'm a great actress. Well, that <laughs> moment where she's like, if only he could hear my voice, Truman, like. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Laura Linney, clearly, pretty clearly like, you know, She's doing her best, but like can't stand him. And I love that whenever she crosses, she kind of like looks down as if like I have to find my mark and then I'm going to hit my mark and then I'm going to sit like those yeah. little things. But yeah, Marlon, the friend, you do feel like he does genuinely care for Truman yeah. in a way that is certainly different from Meryl. And uh, I, I just think that I love that all of that is in there. And I also love the the. The midpoint handoff scene is where, yeah, just the structure of this movie is really interesting. And I think it flows so seamlessly from the first half, for, like between all the acts, really. But so first act, setting everything up. Second act, Truman's trying to get away. He can't. Midpoint, he's, you know, has a knife to Meryl, basically. And like his friend walks in and all this stuff. So they're sitting on the dock. And Marlon is making this emotional plea of like, you know, if everyone's in on it, I like I'd have to yeah. be on it. I'm not in on it. And I just love that that's when the movie decides to really re like reveal Kristoff, who we haven't seen since the very, very beginning. And the way it happens where it's like this emotional scene, it's this big turning point. And then this whole other aspect is layered on to this. So you're watching an actual emotional scene, but you're watching this God character feed lines to Marlon who feels like he actually has an emotion. Like all those things happen. Uh, I just love that scene. I love the music. And then as you guys are saying, we're with Kristoff and we're in that world for a pretty long time. And we don't see Truman again for several minutes. And it's, kind of only after he's decided uh, I'm going to have a normal day. I'm going to look like I'm playing along and everything's going to be fine. But secretly, my plan is to sneak out at the end of the day. And so there's this perspective shift where instead of being with Truman, we're with the people watching Truman in all these different ways. And it's so effective and really well executed. Yeah. It's also really brilliant that the scene leading into our lack of information about Truman is that scene with his best friend, because you can interpret Truman's reaction to his friend in that moment as being won over as being like convinced. Yeah. The problem is me. If you're in on it, then that's not even possible. I, I, I'm the one who's crazy, but in retrospect, if, if it's clear that Truman kind of planned out his escape and did this last day kind of in, in preparation for escape, then his reaction is the kind of horror and grief of realizing his friend is lying to him in this way, in that scene. So it's really fun. It's one of those scenes you can go back and rewatch. And I think Jim Carrey's performance can be read either way. And I think it actually makes more sense the latter way where the grief on his face is actually realizing his friend is lying to him about this very emotional thing. Yeah. And I love the that we have this cast of supporting characters in Truman's world that we spend the first half of the movie with. And then we actually have a cast of supporting characters in Kristoff's world that have right. these little emotional moments as well. Um, I adore Paul Giamatti in this. Uh, the name of his character is Simeon. I guess I looked it up. Um, <laughs> sure. Fascinating. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have Chloe. Uh, the last time we see her, she strolls in in her um, slippers and is talking to Kristoff about that in the middle of the night um, where, where Truman went. And and then Philip Baker Hall is there, you know, representing the network. And um, I just... Underutilized, I, but... Yeah, incredibly underutilized, but yeah. yeah. But it is interesting that we have all of these other supporting characters, you kind of feel like you get to know a little bit in the last, like, it's really the last third of the movie, but you feel like you're getting to spend 
time enough with them to understand sort of how they see Truman, how they relate to Truman. There's this young guy, right, that's there with Paul Giamatti's character. We know he's kind of new and like doesn't really know. He hasn't been on this journey the whole time. So he's kind of still in awe of the whole thing, being in the control room and everything. Um, I don't know. I just think it's a really, again, I guess sophisticated is what I mean, but just it would, you know, giving all those characters little emotional moments, I think helps uh, keep that second half of the movie feeling like rich and interesting and like we're not missing something when we're like not spending time with Truman. That lets the sort of like sh tiny shifts of dynamics of everybody up in the control room and how they're interacting with each other. And of course, which I hope we get to all of the people who are watching and the journeys that they go on. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting also that like, you know, you're talking about people disappearing and I'm, I was thinking back and like, after we see Truman hugging his dad, do we see him and his dad like reunited? <laughs> no, we see his dad walking arm in arm with his mom when they're searching the square, right? Right. right. And that's yeah, the last time we see him either. We, yeah. We don't see them together, him no, and Truman together. There's not a scene of them like talking <laughs> or anything. Yeah. No. It's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I also think it's really interesting the cast of Truman Show watchers that we get to visit in these brief, you know, single shots of the waiters at the bar or the kind of the old couple that are like fall asleep on the couch watching the Truman Show. They have pillows with Truman's face on it, all these things. I think the movie kind of like what you were saying earlier, Brian, about like the restraint that this movie also isn't trying to paint people that like this show as like evil or bad people. Like, mm. it's not like, isn't it disgusting that people sure. like watch this? Like it's showing that this is something that does provide maybe meaning is too strong of a word, but joy, comfort. It, yes. Yeah, exactly. And so, Catharsis. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I, I just love that this movie has room for that, but that these same people are also then depicting him getting out like i think that's right you know the celebration of the human spirit that's also happening with the commentary and sort of satire aspects there are a lot of movies where we cut to multiple people in usually in bars watching yeah. like a tv and like re responding to it right i've it, sometimes it works fine sometimes it feels like lazy screenwriting where it's like well we need to tell you you're supposed to be happy here so we'll cut to some people cheering right um but obviously it works so well in a movie where the entire premise is the world is watching this character so so we want to see their relationship with that character. They want to see them. We want to see them cheer at the end and not go, wait a minute, my favorite show is canceled because that, you know, like they care more about the protagonist of the show than they care about themselves. And then I think there's an extra meta level where to me, the biggest crisis point in this movie is not about something the protagonist is going through. It's about the audience, the actual audience watching the movie, the Truven show going, uh oh, has he been completely like suckered back into this world, right? Like, because obviously then that's where we get the POV shift where it's it's slowly revealed that he is planning his, you know, Shawshank escape. Um, but like for a second there, for like a five minute period, we, the audience have been uh, in like an extra meta level have been suckered into, into thinking like, oh, maybe everything's back to square one now and then it's gonna where's this movie even gonna go if if truman is just sort of accepting this reality in a way that we were hoping he would escape from well there's an interesting i guess it's kind of a double bind that happens when you're making a movie about entertainment right which is you want to explore the role of the audience in potentially a negative way um, when it comes to entertainment and exploitation. And we touched on this a little bit with Gladiator when we were talking to uh, the Toms about Gladiator and, uh, from uh, Cinema of Meaning. And we talked about how that movie definitely felt like it held back in some ways on its like conversation about the audience's responsibility in the exploitation of like, in that case, gladiators who are forced to fight to the death. Uh, and in this case, I think the movie is also very kind overall toward audiences 
of reality TV, and whether or not it is exploitative. And in this case, it definitely is. But there's this like sort of wholesomeness to their interest in Truman, right? Um, we kind of love the people that are watching. As you pointed out, Michael, there's no one there that like feels like they're wishing Truman ill or that they want like more drama or bloodshed or, or something like that. Uh, it feels like they, they all genuinely care for him as a person. You know, you have that really sweet little moment where the family is practicing their English. And then you have this other moment of, you know, um, those ladies falling asleep, you know, the couple on the couch that are falling asleep. And there are these really, you know, you get this, this uh, true investment in, in Truman's well-being and happiness. There are plenty of people you get the feel like that you get the feeling that want him to be as happy as he can be while at the same time adoring their favorite show. And I think that there's such an interesting conversation or theme running through here about consumerism, which was a huge theme in the nineties, um, especially in like American culture. Uh, but yeah, there's where you see people wearing like Truman show gear and like having like posters and merch. And it talks about how everything on the show is for sale and, you know, Meryl's always selling things to the audience. There's this sort of like consumerism thread, but the movie doesn't dwell too much on it because otherwise we, the audience of this movie, start to feel icky about ourselves as audience members consuming entertainment um, where real people are involved, uh, even if they're all actors and professionals and being treated perfectly. So it is this sort of interesting position you always find yourself in as a filmmaker if you want to discuss these themes in your piece of entertainment then you sort of can't get around the irony of making a piece of entertainment about entertainment see also the jurassic franchise <laughs> <laughs> well on that note why don't we talk about what lessons we're going to take away from the truman show alex what's your lesson well, I was looking at the Wikipedia for this movie and saw that satire was one of the main genres it was classified under. And I think it, I don't usually think of it as like full on satire, but this movie is very satirical when it comes to all the things we were just talking about when it comes to American consumerism and entertainment and it also even just like surveillance state. It, it feels like part of the we're talking about how this movie doesn't feel realistic a lot of the time and some of that is the satirical aspect i think i mean the the impossibility of this like insane mega dome <laughs> constructed somehow in the middle of los angeles that 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 is like a joke almost uh but i i love how this movie does lean into kind of a dark satire of so much of american culture where whether it's the kind of everything is for sale everything is for consumption at like aspect of the show, the the Laura Linney bits where she's selling things are just brilliant. And I and I think it's the what's disturbing about the satire is how it has aged well. Yeah. <laughs> like like you you, you talked, Trisha, about how this was like a 90s thing to kind of talk about consumerism. And I feel like it's just everything's on steroids now. Now, you know, we're getting the product placement in our TikTok videos and in our Instagram feeds and nothing has actually changed. Just the delivery mechanism has gotten more addictive and more pervasive and the surveillance has gotten more pervasive and more insane. Uh, everybody is Truman now <laughs> um, yeah. as far as cameras uh, in your room and oh, everywhere. Uh, so it's just also, it, the yeah. literal delivery mechanism that we get the products yeah. through has mm -hmm. just been on steroids too. Anyway. Yeah. It's, I think it's, it's a really brilliant satire. It, it's, it's a great example of how you can just kind of capture so many critiques of American life, American ideology, American, like, yeah, capitalism, consumerism, and, and pack it all into a movie in a way that like, like we're saying, doesn't feel kind of aggressive or, off-putting or guilt tripping you as the audience member or, or too literal too on the nose it, it, it does it all perfectly in world but man it nails it to the point where like 
once again, like it hasn't aged. It it got to the core of so many trends and memes of American, yeah, capitalism that we still have. And it's just the forms have just gotten more hyper and fast <laughs> and pervasive. And I think the production design is a huge aspect of that, where it's mm -hmm. like this little 1950s town and like everything. It, it feels like it's trading in American iconography right? in a way that's just like a super quick shortcut to like, here is the, you know, post-World War II, 1950s American dream of like... Mad Men. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Very Mad Men mm. era, success, you know, wealth, family, like small town life, very sort of false or papered over version of like all of our problems kind of thing. And so I think just it's smart to set it in that kind of a world. Um, and Laura Linney is just like the, the perfect embodiment right. of it. The poses that yeah. she strikes are just like yeah, stuck in my satire. brain. She yeah, is. Right. She's amazing. She is yeah. yeah. And, and I think you're, you're so right, Trisha, you know, by setting it in that 1950s Americana iconography, you're going to the source, you're going to the root. Like this is where right. this era of American life began. Uh, this and and we're still now we're in this weird. Somebody shouted out uh, Baudrillard in, 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 on our uh, Patreon like uh, questions list, and I think I've read very tangentially about Baudrillard and and simulacrum theory, whatever. But the, basically, his theory is that with every stage of civilization, we're getting more and more abstracted from reality. Like, you know, we we kind of had like some basic symbols to represent, you know, trading goods back in like pre-modern eras. And now we're so far out from like any connection to reality. Everything is symbols. Everything is like fake. And like we're living in a world of just ideas and symbols and nothingness um and and i think that acceleration of that has been the post-world war ii era till now and we're just on an exponential curve upwards it feels like but as marlon says in the beginning it's not fake it's just controlled <laughs> 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 i think it's interesting too i mean mad men we've talked about it here but it's one of my favorite shows but this movie is also interested in discussing the role that advertising played right. in the creation of that world or the creation of that ideal um like how advertising built the american dream basically or at least like visualized for us what it was supposed to look like kind of thing or in this case our you know grandparents so i think it's really interesting yeah. Yeah. It is. And I think like you were saying, Alex, I think it's cool that the movie doesn't doesn't feel like it's about you should feel bad for being a consumer. It feels like we're going to tell you a story and your access, your way into the story is like by using these things that you're familiar with. Like we're just going to take things from everyone's life and use it to tell the story. And so it's all here, but the focus is on the story, but it's all here. So I feel like somewhere in there is how it is able to kind of have its cake and eat it too. And the movie's not accusing any of us of creating that system. It, it's just, it is just the system we are all awash in just like Truman is. And he's trying to row his way out. Yeah. Sale really, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, what's your lesson? Yeah. You know, we, we touched on the, the sort of inciting sequence of this movie that I was sort of fascinated by this time. And I've, there's a lot of movies where I recognize that whether there is a specific inciting incident or a specific midpoint or a specific crisis, the movie's less interested in a sharp turn as it is an organic curve, I guess you could say. Right. Um, and and, and I like that. I don't think I'm saying I'm not saying movies should do that and not a sharp turn, but I do like the organic feeling you get from that. And I think especially in dramas, you know, you don't get it's not Dorothy landed in Oz. It's not. Well, the whole family's coming for Christmas or whatever. You know what I mean? Like big genre, high concept things where it's like this big thing has happened and now everything is different. I do like that, especially dramas, but any movie can kind of have these like soft, soft shifts into, into the next act or into a turning point. So we have Truman being already restless. We have him seeing his dad. We have this flashback where it's like, oh, he's kind of already like he's inciting. It's that it happened 
years ago almost right uh, and like this is we're only now seeing the kind of the kind of payoff of that and then he hears the radio chatter and um so i just i like when it, it you know it's almost like everything from the beginning of this movie until the first act break feels like it's all part of this greater inciting incident so i think it's just something to think about with whatever script you're writing is it a sharp turn is a sharp turn always the best way to go or is it sometimes the right way to go to kind of have these these incremental shifts that then organically you know turn the plot into a new direction so much work narratively has to be done for any of those shifts to happen and so i love that as you're pointing out that the truman show makes use of time jumps and we can jump back and show the inciting incident that happened for him years ago, but for us is coming exactly when you would want it in a narrative structure. And it uses that to create, I think, a more believable, you know, turning point, yeah. like him deciding to, I'm going to step out into traffic and put my arms up and this epic music is going to get Michael really jazzed while he's watching it. <laughs> uh, like that's earned over years, right? It's that like it's a straw that breaks the camel's back as opposed to like you're saying, it's like one day he decided 180 degrees to be different based on the events of the past five minutes that we've watched kind of thing. Well, and this is exactly my lesson because it isn't just the outside incidents that like basically push Truman along his arc, right? It's that we, the movie is really great at giving him choices all along that show us that he is willing to rebel, that he is not a drone, that he does have desires and needs, and he's willing to seek them like at risk to himself. He buys those magazines every day and he looks at them at work and like, you know, rips pages out to get the exact right eyes for his uh, collage that he's making. He's taking risks in his life um, because he is not going to play by the rules all the time. And so I think that that's another reason why this movie really works is that from the very beginning, you get this, the movie in its text and in Jim Carrey's incredible performance where he's so perfectly cast where his zany moments come out in these moments of rebellion, right? Like where... It's when he's, you know, <laughs> driving around in that circle, like yelling at Meryl about uh, going to Atlantic City, <laughs> like does the most Jim Carrey thing of all time, like screaming and hollering. And um, but those are those moments of rebellion where it's like Truman is a wild card, you know, and we see that from very early on that there are these things in him that will not be controlled. And so we b fully believe that this journey is possible for him. The minute that he finds out which way he's supposed to go, he's going to go that way. Um, he's just like looking for the opportunity. And so that's why I think that the climax is so gorgeous because he's willing to risk death at a certain point, right? And Christoph, despite all the evidence to the contrary, Christoph refuses to believe that he would be willing to die to escape this world. He says that to Sylvia. Christoph says that to Sylvia on the phone. He's like, he does want to be safe. If he really wanted to find out the truth, there'd be no way we could prevent him. But he prefers this cage. He prefers this world. We know that's not true, right? We've seen all along, or we want to believe that's not true because there's been evidence planted all along the way. A good character arc is what you're saying, Brian. It doesn't come out of left field. It's pushed and pushed and pushed by the movie mm -hmm. with the, along with the characters like natural design um the way that the character has been created and those things have to be there from the very beginning and that's why the the climactic choice feels completely earned when we say things feel earned that's what we mean is that they have been built to all along in a satisfying way such a duh thing, but yeah. you could have easily not done this. Make him, yeah. as a kid, want to be an explorer. It's so nice that this movie, from the beginning, says this is a guy who has wanderlust, who wants to see the world, and this world has found ways to box him in. But like we've been talking about, there's probably a different version of this movie where it's like, yeah, he's the guy who perfectly loves his perfect town and loves his perfect life until something comes in and like wakes him up. And that just wouldn't be as satisfying as seeing somebody who like 
has this innate urge that has been repressed finally pursuing it. Um, it's a just very different story than the perfect guy with a perfect life story. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the, the inner true self that wants to go. It's like Neo. Neo was looking for a way exactly. out before he gets Neo. out of the Matrix all right. that stuff. Or we yeah. talked about it in The Devil Wears Prada where there's like a microcosm of the whole movie of someone standing up for themselves early on. And even though they're going to continue to get like run over for most of the half of the movie, we see early on that rebellious streak that we're eventually going to, that's eventually going to break them out of their cycle by the end. Yeah. And well, and what you were just talking about there, Trisha, runs into my lesson, which is, uh, yeah, that that moment really hit me in the finale uh, when Truman's on the boat and he's like, is that the best you can do? You're going to have to kill me. It's like, OK, cool. And it's powerful mm. for the reasons you were describing. He's willing to die to be able to truly live. It's like so powerful. And I think it's really interesting that thinking back across the structure of the movie where it's kind of like the first half, like we get a little tease of Kristoff in the very beginning. First half is Truman getting to know kind of opponent A. And then midpoint, we start to switch, see things from Kristoff's side. Now we're seeing opponent B. And Kristoff is exactly the opposite of Truman, right? Like it's just a good design of an antagonist where he's willing to kill Truman to prevent him from leaving. And so you... We see them, we understand their passions, what their philosophies are. Ed Harris's performance is so amazing. And you just like get the passion that they both feel in completely 180 degrees, opposite directions, which makes that final uh, escape sequence so thrilling. The way it's shot is kind of haphazard, like it's not like a great action scene, but it's powerful because it's you know, these two people fighting over like life essentially, and one is willing to kill and one is willing to die to live. And it's just so epic and beautiful. I mean, it's literally at that point, like man versus deity. Like, right. Like, man like, versus Literally God. in its portrayal. <laughs> yeah. Design a good antagonist that is, you know, diametrically opposed to your protagonist, if you want, like a nice fable parable, epic uh, ending that, like you said earlier, Trisha then just answers the dramatic question and gets out and has come and said and done the thing that it wants to do. I hear you made a video about that, Michael. <laughs> Something about antagonists. <laughs> speaking speaking of uh, actors who play Batman villains, so there's a, like a little I don't know oh, Batman yeah. Forever, right? Just no, like yeah, really the, smooth the best transition. One, my favorite one, yeah. Yeah. the Riddler. <laughs> Who's afraid of the big black bat? <laughs> uh, amazing. Okay, so we're going to talk about what we've been watching recently. Quick reminder before we do, we're going to be discussing Avatar in the next episode. You sound really excited, Michael. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I'm excited to rewatch it. I am super curious. I literally don't think I've seen it since we stood in line for too many hours to see it at the IMAX and Metreon in San Francisco. You never watched it again after that? No. You saw it just the one time? Maybe I saw it one other time. and I, I did see it one other time. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I've seen it twice, two hundred years ago. Whatever this it was. Be a good conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm very curious to revisit it. Yep. In the meantime, what else have you guys been watching, Brian? What have you been watching recently? Uh, I have been watching the final season of The Walking Dead, wow. and man, I don't care. Um, you know, like talking about dramatic questions. Like this is just a show that is never had one like uh, like in a bigger sense of it um if you have like friends or the office like will they won't they you know you're waiting for this or like breaking bad mad men game of thrones it's like a character has a secret and you're waiting to find out if another character is going to find it and you you will watch for years to like see if that thing happens right and walking dead has been 12 years of like people surviving a zombie apocalypse and <laughs> and sometimes there's a storyline you know, like that's compelling. Samantha Morton was like a really crazy villain for a season or two. And that was really cool. Um, but mostly it's like either there's a weird gang that we have to defeat who has their own cult way of talking, even though it's only been like two years since the apocalypse. But apparently it's Mad Max or we found this really <laughs> idyllic community and everything's perfect. But like there's but there's a it? dark secret, right? <laughs> and it's like literally been those two storylines over and over again. 
the current season, um, there's a courtroom drama uh, that happens, wow. like in a courtroom, like not not like, you know, people at oil drums or whatever, like back like, no, just full on. Yeah, it's just. But like we're still in the apocalypse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But like, you know, sometimes there are zombies. Uh, um, so anyway, I'm not trying to pick on this franchise that is like still growing and a lot and has still has a lot of fans and stuff. But I just think it's an interesting conversation. One about the dramatic question thing where it's like it's the final season and there's still no like dismantling of the story world happening or anything like that. Like once it, the thing that they're trying to do, if they do it, it's going to kind of feel like the end of any other season, basically. But then also an interesting conversation about being, you know, as we call it in poker, pot committed, where once you put in enough money, you kind of have to stay in. Right. Uh -huh. And just those franchises, you know, whether it's something huge like Star Wars or the MCU or whether it's just like a, a TV series or a movie, fran like a smaller movie franchise where you're just kind of like, you know what? I've come this far. <laughs> I guess I guess I'll finish it off. Um, but, you know, it's just it's been an interesting it's been an interesting ride to go from like kind of being interested in the show to being like really interested for maybe two years to then just like several years of being like, well, I've got some homework to do and it's to catch up on this show until it doesn't exist anymore. So, yeah, that's if you if you dropped off at some point and you're wondering whether to come back in, I can give you a resounding. Eh. I've definitely been pot committed to some seasons of television that I yeah. didn't need Guys, to have finished. That is called a sunk cost fallacy. Exactly. You guys yeah. need to extract yourselves from that immediately. There's a clear action to be taken. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's real. The feeling is real. I wasted this much time. I might as well finish it. Do not have to do that. <laughs> wonder how we got into that situation. Alex, what have you been watching recently? <laughs> I do not feel that way about a new show on Amazon called uh, The Peripheral, uh, which is mm. not a perfect show, but uh, I'm always looking for good sci-fi. And I think doing sci-fi well on television with the kind of budgets it requires and the kind of world building it requires is very difficult. And I've had a lot of shows in recent years that I was really excited about in the sci-fi genre that ended up being not my favorite. Uh, and the peripheral is just a really interesting, cool sci-fi based on a novel based on a novel by, uh, William Gibson. Um, and it's just like cool sci-fi, my kind of sci-fi. Like it's, it, the novel was only written, you know, like eight years ago. Um, so it's, it's pretty fresh sci-fi. It's not like based off a classic novel and it's just about, uh, I won't spoil anything, but it's it essentially starts off, uh, kind of as, as like a meta verse VR story that quickly gets more complicated. Um, but it stars Chloe Grace Moretz and, uh, Jack Rayner, who you might recognize as the boyfriend from Midsummer. <laughs> Uh, mm. but, and they're doing Southern accents, which if you are from the South may be terrible, but to my <laughs> California ears sound fine. Uh, but it's, it's just a really, if you're, if you're into just interesting sci-fi ideas done relatively well, it's worth checking out the peripheral. Nice. Cool. Okay. Trisha, what have you been watching? Well, I'm only 30 minutes into it because I had to stop it. Um, but I started watching Weird, the Al Yankovic story, and mm. I am so obsessed. It's so funny. It's so good. Daniel Radcliffe, hilarious. Everything about it is just like so sharp and, oh, God, it's funny. Anyway, uh, but I can't talk more about that because I'm not done with it yet. <laughs> but then the other thing I've been watching is Andor and mm. – uh, God, I want to talk about Andor. Let's talk about Andor. If you're not watching Andor, Andor is the new Star Wars show on your Disney Plus starring Diego Luna uh, as his character from Rogue One, uh, Cassian Andor. And it rules so hard. It's so good. I was very, very skeptical that another Star Wars show could be remotely good at all or something that I personally would be into. And I'm so into Andor. Um, and it's, you know, I could talk about it for ages. So I just want to say uh, that season has not wrapped up yet, that first season of Andor. Um we're about, I think, two thirds or three quarters of the way through it. There's a few more episodes to go. But if you are loving Andor and you want to talk to me about it, 
First of all, jump on our Discord because there's a very Discord lively, loves it. <laughs> very wonderful conversation happening over there about how much we all adore Andor. But then also you could just like tweet at me. Uh, well, maybe not if Twitter doesn't exist by the time you hear this, but right. <laughs> you could contact me on other social media. Uh, the world is fun right now. Anyway. <laughs> also, one of the best trailers ever for a TV show. Oh, hell yeah. The Andor trailer. Yeah. Was trailer like, was amazing. So anyway, weird, you know. good, Andor, great. Rogue One had a really good trailer too. So, just say <laughs> did have a good trailer. Yeah. That was a very good trailer. Well, Andor is like you know, if you want to see the people who made like Michael Clayton and you know directed Sherlock and Black Mirror, like the make a series. Star Wars, yeah, show. yeah, exactly. It's like, oh yeah, you, you did it. Yeah, they did. Nice, Michael. I recently watched Turning Red, uh, which oh, I nice. the, you know the Pixar movie that I kind what of missed delight. when it came out. Uh, yeah, it, but I really didn't know what to expect and kind of from like the promotional material that I happened upon, didn't really understand what the story was, but it's really good. It's this like story of this 13 year old girl kind of going through like coming of age, growing up stuff and dealing with stuff with her mom and like her changing body, which in this case involves turning into a red panda when she gets too excited. <laughs> So it takes place in like 2000, I think, 2002, something like that. So she's our age, basically. So it's like it's a millennial middle school mm. movie, which I was not emotionally prepared for and definitely <laughs> created some existential crises to be like watching a movie and remembering what it was like for me as a kid to watch movies with my parents when they would be like, oh, wow, it's so weird to see like our high school depicted yeah. in like oh, old movies. And like that's how I'm feeling of like they're making a thing out of like Texting on the, anyway, so. Retro period piece, 2000 <laughs> yeah. movie. Yeah. Boy bands, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. right, boy bands. So uh, I both loved it and had an existential crisis because of that fact. But overall, I just thought it was like a really fun, funny, charming, uh, really well-made movie. So Turning Red, if you missed it, uh, thumbs up, check it out. Love it. And I would uh, request that the person who makes our letterbox uh, list of all of our what we're watching makes a second list of movies that one of us recommends. And then Michael discovers for the first time a year later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Portrait of a Lady on Fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've, yeah, I need to have a, like a tab of like, has someone talked about this? I try to remember. It. Anyway. I've just heard about turning about red, and that's great. <laughs> Have you guys heard of Pixar? It's this little company. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been our episode on The Truman Show. We want to say a big thank you to the patrons that make this show possible. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major, our editors, Caleb Berg, Graham Harther, and Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker, and I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Ryan Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. So all of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet and say hi. We'll see you in the next episode for Avatar. And in case we don't see you... Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night. <laughs>